uh, I lead uh, uh, what we call uh, operations transformation, uh, uh, which is kind of our name for uh, digital transformation. Uh, I'm with uh, Invista. Invista is an advanced materials company. Uh, we're the largest producer of nylon 6.6. We're also a large producer of uh, polypropylene. Uh, we are a relatively small company, about 3,000 employees, uh, but we're uh, an operating company of uh, Coke Industries, which is the largest privately held company in the, in the U.S., uh, 130,000 employees, over $100 billion of revenue. So, uh, and, and we have the opportunity to uh, interact with all of our sister companies as well. So uh, uh, it's a nice uh, chance in this operations transformation space to do a lot of uh, uh, leverage back and forth. So I'll be talking about... Uh, uh, how we have implemented uh, in, 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 uh, in the current state, uh, it's still a, a work in progress. Uh, we're in year four of our transformation effort. Uh, but I had the opportunity to, uh, to meet uh, Professor Jerry Kane uh, four years ago at an IRI event, so the, the power of IRI. Uh, I was just coming into this role uh, and starting to think about you know, how I might be able to frame uh, operations transformation, and I had a chance to hear Jerry talk about his work in uh, what was called his new, or at that time his new book, The Technology Fallacy, and uh, I've actually uh, based a lot of the things that uh, we've done in practice with operations technology on some of the, uh, the work that Jerry has, has done and continues to do. So Jerry, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Okay, uh, can everybody hear me okay, I hope? Um, my yep. name is Jerry Kane. I am a new professor uh, of information systems at University of Georgia. Formerly, I was at Boston College for 15 years, so I'm going back home to the South. And the we ha I have two books. The first uh, that Jerry introduced was um, The Technology Fallacy, How People Are the Real Key to Digital Transformation. And the second one is The Transformation Myth, leading your organization through uncertain times. Um, both initiatives were done in conjunction with MIT Sloan Management Review and Deloitte. And basically for the first book, we looked at, spent five years researching how companies were responding to digital disruption. Uh, and that's the one Jerry heard about last time. And then the new book um, is, we actually pitched uh, in March of 2020 about how companies were adapting to uh, the disruption of the pandemic. And so very fascinating to study uh, how companies were responding to COVID uh, while it was going on. And they actually fit pretty well together. Many of the lessons learned in the technology fallacy um, still apply uh, to all that we've dealt with over the last couple of years. And we'll, we'll get more of a into it as uh, Jerry tells his story. And then I can sort of uh, put some theoretical lenses and some takeaways uh, on his stuff. So Jerry, giving it back to you. Great. So, uh, so I'm going to start talking about what we've been working on for the last four years, uh, and uh, particularly this idea of putting people first. And then, as Sherry mentioned, he'll be covering kind of uh, uh, how that science has continued to advance, uh, and, and we've certainly been continuing to learn as well. So, Jerry, if you go to the, uh, the, the next slide. Well, there, there we, we go. go. Perfect. So we certainly heard this morning uh, that... Um, uh, you know, it is all about data, and, uh, and we had some great examples from our, our colleague at, at Porsche. And, you know, many times when I'm talking to operators and mechanics about, you know, why should we be working on this, why should they be excited, why is their world changing, uh, it is certainly about technology. So, you know, technology is kind of the why and the why now of digital transformation. And we've been hearing about it, you know, for the last couple of days, you know, data being readily available, you know, access across platforms, data analytics, we've talked a lot about that and how that can predict outcomes. Uh, connected worker, I'll be talking a lot about that, or all these things that are now possible. The idea of a robotic and automated workforce, I call it the, the four Ds. You know, we want to automate things that are dirty, difficult, dangerous, or disinteresting. And anywhere you have those types of activities, we should be seeking to automate those. So idea of digital twins uh, uh, that uh, is now possible. So, you know, all of this, you know, is or soon will be possible. Virtually all of it is very much possible now uh, and in practice. Uh, and kind of our mission is to make it actionable, uh, you know, wherever that's possible profitable to do so. So, you know, that's kind of the why and the why now is, is all about technology. But as we've been leading up to this, you know, it's really people and ultimately work processes uh, that are really important. So, Jerry, if you go to the next slide. 
So we're kind of saying that people in the work processes are the how of digital transformation. And, and one of the ways that I really connected with, uh, with Jerry Kane's book, uh, The Digital Fallacy, and maybe it's because when he was presenting, uh, uh, I had just moved to Kansas. Uh, and uh, he starts his book with, uh, with the metaphor of, of the Wizard of Oz. And that he says that, um, you know, it's easy to focus on the tornado uh, that kind of caused Dorothy to wind up in Oz, but that's not what the story is about. You know, you hardly ever see anything about the tornado uh, in the whole book or the story. Uh, so, you know, the tornado in that, in that uh, metaphor, that's what caused the disruption. That, that transported Dorothy to the new area. But the whole book, the story, and how, you know, the interest of it, why we care, is it's her journey, or the struggle, as we've heard uh, uh, today, uh, about that transformation. So, you know, if you think about technology as kind of the why, but it's really about the journey, the struggle along the way. The value of digital transformation, then, really comes from the, the people acting as entrepreneurs, being lifelong learners, changing the work itself. So one of the things that we really talk about is people, processes, and technology in that order. It's got to really start with the people. And we, again, we've heard some of this over the last couple of days. It's really essential that all roles change. I mean, if you're really driving transformation, it's not something that IT does. It's not something that engineers do, or certainly in a vacuum. It's got to affect everybody. Now, obviously, I say that as, as focusing in operations. But I, I truly believe no matter what part of the organization you're in, it's got to really affect everyone. And affect them to the sense that the jobs themselves are fundamentally different. So again, in, in chemical plant operations, you know, you've usually got the inside jobs and the outside jobs. You know, you get the board operator inside, you got the field operators, field mechanics on the outside. If you're really going to transform, those got to be completely different jobs. And you should call them something different because they are different jobs. So we have now kind of adopted that they're not board operators anymore, they're process analysts. You've got so much automation coming to that person now. They should be able to look much broader than they have in the past. It's a fundamentally different job, requires different training, different skill sets. Your field personnel, you know, don't even call people operators and mechanics anymore. They're connected field technicians uh, because that is the nature. The job itself is fundamentally different with different skills and different incentives. Uh, if they're really going to take on the skill set, learn these new things and practice them, you're going to pay them a lot more because they're a whole lot more valuable. The role of the supervisor is very different. Again, this idea of all roles change. You know, historically, in, in a manufacturing environment, your supervisor, your, your lead operator or your lead mechanic was oftentimes the person who was the best operator, was the, the best mechanic. That's not the role of the supervisor anymore. The role of the supervisor is to enable your employees to fully self-actualize, to be all they can be. It's a coach. That's a very much different role. And we talked about change management. It was helpful that um, you know, we had that, um, just that, that exercise we just had on change management. Because not all supervisors are good at this. And if you really want to look at change management, Sometimes the most important thing you got to do is change management. Uh, because if folks aren't embracing this, they don't see that's that role. This is the frozen middle. And these are the people now that will really block your overall transformation. We've had sites that have been the most successful. We have 13 global sites that have had to change out 70% of their supervisors. That doesn't mean they all left and you know, left the company, but that means they're in very different roles. They might have gone back to being a very capable operator or mechanic. But if you're going to lead people in a digital transformation, your job's a coach. Your job's not the best operator or the best mechanic. Jerry, you can go to the, the next one. So kind of this, this journey of where you know, uh, we've come in Invista operations over the last several years. So I got to see uh, Jerry in, in fourth quarter of 2018 when I, when I came into this role. And one of the first things we did was put our vision together for operations change management. So this came out in uh, January of 2019. So this is year four now of, of what we've been doing in, in applying this vision. So the actual vision statement is, is, is to, the, to the far, uh, you're, you're right. Uh, we want to really transform the way that we interact with our sites. The work itself transforms. That's the vision statement. If you go all the way over to, to your left, 
we were building off an enabling foundation. We have a, we have a, a really big push that's been around for a long time in our company around, around culture, this idea of contribution mindset, uh, that people really think and lead to think of each other as, or think of themselves as entrepreneurs. We were building off a data platform. Uh, we were, certainly have a number of folks that are true blue data scientists and talking about citizen data scientists. So we had a lot of that in place. So if that's where you are in that, you know, that foundation and you're trying to get to that future state, how you get from here to there are these four transformation work streams. So this is what we've been working on for the last four years. So the first one of those was around learning development. We used to talk a lot about training. And you know, I'm gonna train you to be an operator. I'm gonna train you to be uh, the next level of mechanic. But, but that's very kind of focused not on the worker. You know, if I'm going to train you, I'm training you and you're just the trainee. If you're really going to embrace this digital environment, it's got to be more learning. You've got to own that. You've got to actually do something different. You've got to learn some new skills. You've got to build your skills. So it's more than just semantics. It's really important to get that in mind of folks if you're going to really think that people first uh, approach. Also in this work stream, a lot of work around mobility. We do a tremendous amount of AR, VR work. Uh, so, so that's all kind of part of that particular work stream. The, the second one there around process control, so in a, in a chemical in a plant environment, uh, uh, there's always been a big focus on process control. But as we've continued to advance what's now possible with the digital transformation, machine learning models, uh, um, uh, anomaly detection models, uh, state-based controls, which is a much broader definition of process control, all of that is now possible, and we've been really pushing that. The, the third one there around material flow automation. So besides uh, upstream chemical manufacturing, we also have polymer and, and fiber processing. As you move downstream, you got a lot more touch with the product. Uh, and so there's opportunities around just uh, movement of product with uh, guided vehicles, robots and cobots. But the other big aspect of this work stream is camera-based inspections. We had an awful lot of jobs where the last step of quality was a person actually looking at a spool of yarn and judging a variety of different uh, quality parameters. You have four seconds to look at each spool of yarn as it goes by. How'd you like that job and do that for eight hours? A camera is much better at that. A camera can look at 17 different parameters and do it in real time, doesn't need to take breaks, and, and after a little bit of learning is actually much better than the person. So there's a lot of work there on, on camera-based inspections. And the last work stream is uh, asset performance management. Some people call that the digitization of the fleet. That's where you're using tons of wireless sensors and you're really uh, uh, no longer having to do field inspections of, of different pieces of, of information, temperatures, pressures, humidity, uh, vibration. Uh, you can take advantage of the fact that you've got all these digital sensors now and you can bring them in and, and really uh, significantly uh, advance your opportunity to get out of time-based inspection and do more condition-based inspection. So, you know, my, my uh, mental model for that is think of your car. You know, you used to change your oil every 3,000 miles. You know, now your car monitors that for you, tells you when the oil needs to be changed and schedules the appointment for you. Uh, that works in the automobile, can actually absolutely work in a, a chemical plant environment. So those are our four work streams. We've been working on those for four years. And kind of the mental model is we want to we talk a lot about data, and you want to transform that data to knowledge. Everybody's doing that. But the next two steps are really important. You want to go from knowledge to action and action to value. And the most important step is action. If you have truly got new knowledge now, you've got all this new data and information coming out of those four work streams, and you've created a different piece of knowledge than you had before, you should be able to do something different, fundamentally different. You know, if you wind up doing the same job or taking the same action as you took five years ago before you did all this, you know, you're maybe slightly incrementally better. So you really should be able to do the job fundamentally different. The work itself has to change because if you can take a transformative action, then you can get transformative value. So we really talk about that whole cycle. So that's where we started in 2019. And we've been working on it for four years. So if you go to the next slide, Jared, just to give you a kind of an update of you know, kind of where we've been in the last four years. One of the first things we, we realized is this vision was helpful to show our entire organization kind of what was in scope, what was out of scope, where we were going. Each of these work streams has a much more detailed roadmap of, of how they're going from here to there, what's in their scope. 
But you really don't want to have a separate transformation vision. If you look at the entire global operations organization, that's 2,500 people in every region of the globe, if they look at it as a separate vision versus their site vision, then it's always going to be something external to them. So after a year in, we actually kind of moved away from this one chart as an operations vision, and we now have a single operations vision incorporating these four work streams. So it isn't something other than what a given site is working on. They're working on their immediate deliverables for the business and incorporating those four work streams. And then every year we, we kind of had a focus and not that you're done by the calendar year, but part of this was a ability to try to keep it fresh and, and keep folks focused. So in, in 2019, it was, it was all about pilots and we, we talked about pilots in the last session, you know, kind of get out there and learn, do stuff. Almost didn't matter what you did. You know, we wanted all plants to be kind of active and working on some pilots and in each of these four work streams, so there was some structure on it, but it was really just trying to drive activity. Then 2020 was scale. You know, what are the pilots that look well, that are working, uh, and let's scale those. And, and uh, I was going to mention it in the last section. One of the things that we, we tried to do in, in pilots is um, make a clear decision about a given pilot, and we call it the four Ps. You, you either want to push, which is that things are looking good, push this, let's go faster, let's advance this. You want to pivot. We've learned something about this pilot. We want to pivot to something, apply that learning and go somewhere else. You want to park. It's good idea. It's working well, but for some reason it's not quite ready now. Maybe that a piece of technology isn't ready or you're waiting on an IT data pipeline or something like that. So you can park it or you want to punt. Uh, good idea, nice work but this ain't working, let's move on, get rid of this and start something else. So in your pilots, make, make a clear one of those decisions, you know, uh, push, pivot, park, or punt. So that helped us going into 2020 then on which ones we want to scale. The ones that we've been pushing are the ones we want to scale. And then in 2021, it was, was integrate. Um, you've got a lot of things going on. These are not separate work streams. They're certainly not silos. That's why it's drawn this way. The first time it was drawn, it looks like a house and people started calling them pillars. And I was like, oh my gosh, no, because those are silos. Uh, these are really you know, highly integrated and do overlap. So let's focus on that integration. And then this year is, is acceleration. We've got, we've got a lot of stuff going. We've built a lot of foundation. This overall effort, we said back in 2019 for our company was a $350 million opportunity we track that we're um, we're 140 million in now uh, so now we got to accelerate <laughs> to try to get to the rest of the way there and you're never done uh, but uh, but there's still a lot of value there to be captured if you do all this and this was this was something that we kind of aligned on at, at the end of this year or, or in the beginning of this year was you should achieve an outcome now the outcome is, is obviously that that vision statement but your outcome really from the people standpoint, and that's kind of our theme today, is you should achieve that connected worker. If you really make progress on all four of those work streams, you will produce the connected worker who has the right information at the right time to the right person, and most importantly, in the right context uh, where they can take that transformative action. So we, we now talk about that connected worker as the outcome of our over effort or overall effort. So I've got one more slide, and Jerry, if you jump to that, uh, so we talked about uh, earlier today in one of the sessions around headwinds. Um, you know, if you, if you tell the story enough, and I get to tell it a lot, you know, you say, oh, it, it, it's working well, everything's doing great, uh, you know, uh, just keep on this path and, you, and you'll be doing fine. Uh, you know, nothing ever works that way, that's why I like that uh, struggle versus, versus the journey. One of the biggest headwinds you hear is this whole time argument. So. You know, for the last four years, we've been talking to our 13 global sites, our 2,500 operations team partners, and we've got a lot of good stories. So people say, well, okay, I'm, I'm excited. I get it. I understand why, you know, we want to do that. I have energy about that, but man, I'm, I'm really busy. You know, uh, my team's busy. You know, you, you show me those four work streams. I'm working on three things today. I can't work on numbers four through seven. And as we thought about it, you just have to you can't, there's no response to that. You have, to, you have to just take that whole argument off the table, the time argument, because you shouldn't look at these four work streams or transformation in general 
as something additional to what you're doing now. It is the work. This is the way you should be doing your work. And by the way, your job has to change. Uh, you, we, we, if we don't get here, our Mr. Koch himself said this. Uh, you know, if we don't do this, we'll be in the dumpster. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, this is where you know uh, the the world is going, and we got to be on board with that. So we came up with this metal model that we thought was very helpful. So this is called the red curve, green curve. So if you look at in time on the uh, on the y-axis and uh, kind of value on the x-axis. And no matter what your job is, you know, all 2,500 of our operations employees, kind of just plot your current job, that's the red curve, on this axis. And this becomes essentially universally true. If, if you look at your role, your job, on the, on, the red, on the red curve there, there's some stuff to the far left that is not really all that value adding. I mean, uh, it's kind of repetitive. You're not even sure why you're doing it. Um, you know, you really kind of self-identify that there's some opportunities here for some waste elimination. If you look in the, the middle part, you know, kind of the, you know, the, the highest uh, uh, on the y-axis there, it certainly is value adding. You can see the reason for it. It's not super highly motivating, but you know, somebody's got to do it and it certainly adds value. And then there's stuff off to the right where you say, you know, I really like doing this stuff. I'm excited. I know this is adding value. People come to me and want me to do that. And so you look at your role and, and virtually everybody can, can describe their work that way. If we're able to do those four work streams, if we're able to transform the job itself, you should be able to eliminate that bottom left of this chart and even some of the middle section as well. We have these things we call value creation events where we really go in and look at a job and say, what are you actually doing? And we found universally, we've done hundreds of value creation events now, there's at least 30% of any given job in operations that can truly be eliminated. You're taking information that's already available in the DCS. We can make an easy dashboard and you don't even need to go to that meeting. There's many different ways through work elimination as well as automation that you can cut off a significant part of that red curve, 30 to 40 percent. Universally, we've done hundreds of them. So now you have a choice. We could get rid of 30 percent of our people or you could say, how could you individually use that additional 30 percent? That's the green curve. So if you draw the green curve now, you should have the opportunity, or what Jerry Kane calls the affordance now, to do something additional, embrace some of those transformation work streams. So if you think in an operations standpoint, I have some operators and mechanics that really kind of like data. They're excited about it. They could be a citizen data scientist. Still doing their operations job on shift, but now they're, they're embracing data. I've got people that really like electronics. They can be an OT technician. You've got thousands of sensors out there. You're not calling IT to maintain that sensor. That's operations equipment. We've got to own that. That's OT. We need to really become proficient in that. There's many other skills. We have uh, AR, VR, people that do content in AR, VR. Where did they find a the time to do that? They found it in the green curve. And so we have our entire organization kind of focused on this mental model and our tagline, instead of what's in your wallet, it's what's in your green curve. And you need to have an answer to that. Uh, you need to be thinking about how you individually and then your team can elevate its comparative advantage based on what's in people's green curve. And that's the way you defeat the time argument. Uh, because you're really trying to now to embrace that, yes, you have the opportunity to learn something new. It's essential that you learn something new. And here's a variety of things, and you get to pick based on your innate abilities. And your supervisor is the coach that can help you embrace your green curve and grow and transform. Jerry, uh, the last two slides are yours. Okay, thanks so much. Um, you know, I feel a little bit like a proud parent watching you uh, present that, uh, you know, seeing where it came from and, and knowing what's in the first book and seeing how it gets played out. And, and my moment of greatest pride is hearing you use the word affordances in the presentation. Um, because that's a, it's a concept in the book that didn't get a lot of traction. We rebranded it for the second book that we call superpowers now. So now it's just it's the green curve. Um, so I'm actually going to shift up a little bit from uh, what we what I plan to talk about here. I'll, I'll go back 
uh, and, and touch on these. Um, but one thing that struck me was the, the concept of why now? Um, you know, for Jerry's company, I don't think his timing could have been any better to run the pilots during 2019 and be doing the scaling up activities in 2020 when COVID hit. So, I mean, they were really perfectly positioned to sort of to avoid a lot of the barriers that might have uh, come into play um, at the same time. For companies that haven't started, if you treat COVID as you ran a series of pilots in digital transformation, whether you knew it or not, and I really love Jerry's um, thing of push, pivot, park, or punt, and a great thing to do in your own digital transformations right now would be to to use that framework and say, hey, look at the stuff that we did during COVID. You know, shift to some remote meetings, shift to you know different ways of working. Um, what are the things that we want to push, uh, keep going with, pivot? What are the skills we learned that we could do in different ways? Park, you know, we developed some good things, but let's hold it over here and let's just remain aware. And then punt, let's get rid of it and then go back to the way things were. Um, and so, you know, I think the timing there, the why now, Jerry was really perfectly positioned and and uh, your company also is, is perfectly positioned, but in a different way. Some thoughts I had on this um, is – Mindset shift is really key, particularly that role transformation. You know, as I, I really get one of the unexpected things about writing this book is I'm invited to talk to all sorts of different groups. Um, and occasionally I get invited to groups that I say, why on earth would this industry ever be interested um, in what I have to say? And so I was, I was actually speaking to uh, uh, an association of CEOs of rural electric cooperatives. Um, and so I said, you know, why on earth do these people um, want to talk to me? Um, it turned out to be exactly what they were dealing with. And, and one of them said to me, for their line technicians, the role change has been amongst the most pressing challenges because what, yeah, they had the iPads in place. Yeah, they had uh, all these connected tools. But the biggest challenge was to get the line workers to shift from their understanding that their primary job was no longer to fix the, the line. Their primary job was first to communicate to the customer how long it was going to take for the line to get fixed. Um, and so it, it turns into a customer relations role that they had never experienced before. And, and they could put all the tools in their hands that they wanted, but unless the line workers had that shift of mindset and realized that the role was different, um, they were not gonna succeed. Um, a couple things here, the uh, fail failure is fine, particularly in those pilots, that's the punt, um, but also have the courage to succeed. When you do have something that is successful, the thing that differentiated what we call early stage companies or, or companies that were not very far along on their digital journeys and mature companies, those that were sort of role models for what to do. But I, and I would put Jerry's company in there uh, squarely right now um, is have the courage to succeed. Um, they Everybody ran experiments. Everybody does pilots. Those that really differentiated themselves took the learnings to the pilot to actually drive change in the organization. Um, other types of organizations will experiment and they'll do pilots and then say, oh, look how innovative we are. Look how, how um, you know, how good we're doing. And, and yet the organization doesn't change at all. Um, one of my favorite authors, uh, Eric Reese, uh, who did the Lean Startup, said you're always dealing. So another thing I liked what Jerry said was that entrepreneurial mindset. Um, you know, you're always dealing when you're dealing with uncertainty, you're always dealing with a startup, whether you know it or, or not. Um, and so those are just some of my takeaways. Um, so so con the conclusions um, like the book, not the movie, uh, Dorothy stays uh, in Oz for a long time. So, you know, she doesn't go back to Kansas. She doesn't want to go back to Kansas. Oz is too exciting. Oz is too good. Um, that's what a lot of people, their experience of digital transformation, it's challenging, it's difficult to get there, but once they get there, they never want to go back. Um, it's an iterative process. You know, you do the change, you learn from it, and you do something different. Um, so learning is the real key there. 
Um, and again, going back to, uh, I, I think the challenge that most organizations are dealing with with respect to COVID um, is, you know, d doing that inventory of pilots, push, pivot, park, and punt. What are the things we want to keep? What are the, you know, I, I interviewed uh, the Dutch researcher, uh, Dutch airline KLM, who had gone through the Icelandic volcano disruption and had to use Twitter for customer service um, because every other channel had failed. And so, you know, after the crisis was over, they went back to business as usual. And it was six months later that the CEO said, what are we doing? On the fly, we had developed a very powerful customer service technique. Why did we just abandon it when the crisis was over? And they went back and invested uh, in those capabilities that they had learned. Um, I think that's what we're dealing with with COVID. It's, we did a lot of really, we, the data says we did 10 years worth of transformation work uh, over the course of about 18 months. And so now is the time to do that reflection, to run that pilot assessment. What are the things we wanna push, pivot, park, or punt? Jerry, I'm keeping that. Um, and now is the time to go through that process and really sort of drive some of the changes you've made and the challenge is everybody's exhausted. Everybody just wants to go back to the world as normal. Um, and now is the time to really lock in those changes uh, and become the type of digital uh, organization that we all need to be for the future. Um, so last but not least, this transformation myth, uh, the source of the second book, the, the myth is that digital transformation is a one and done effort. Technology doesn't keep changing. People don't keep changing. The competitive environment doesn't stop changing. Instead, transformation is a continual process that you will always be going on um, if you're if you're doing it right. So, Jerry, outstanding job. Uh, again, it, it's really fun for me to hear your story uh, based in uh, the work we had done. And uh, you get an A for the class is all I have to say. All right. We got time for some some questions or thoughts or comments. Yes. We got a microphone, Jerry, so you'll be able to hear. Thanks for the Boy, I look, good talking. I look very I, scary over this. <laughs> I can see myself. Uh, this is Michelle Yan from Virtual Architectural Glass. Um, I just have some questions related to the operator and engineering level kind of training. Um, because like we went to the plants, we see people are really busy with the process. Mm -hmm. And um, do you have any best practice to share to kind of balance, you know, the trainings and the digital part of the work and you know the real work that they're, they're dealing with because sometimes they have too many fires to put out right well and, and that's I mean it's a great question and it, and it absolutely is reality uh, so uh, uh, there's no magic bullet uh, you know uh, but that um, this thing we call this value creation event which is really just a collection of agile tools uh, it really helps to, to try to get at that so so if you look at the operator job, what are they spending their time on? It's almost mapping that red curve. Uh, because a lot of the things they're doing, um, you know, in many cases is information that's available elsewhere. So can you take advantage of your data historian and produce um, some really helpful knowledge building, um, you know, dashboards? Uh, so a lot of their work don't do, what doesn't, doesn't need to be done anymore. So we actually targeted can we largely eliminate operator rounds? You know, so from, a, from an operator standpoint, it's about, you know, we, we work 12 hour shifts. That's about an hour and a half to two hours a shift they're doing operator rounds. And you say, well, what do you actually do on an operator round? Well, you're out in the field, you're actually taking some measurements, you're looking for, you know, is there any leaks? Do I hear anything? You know, uh, and all that's important. I mean, we're not saying that's not important. But, um, you know, a lot of the things that they're taking a measurement of is already available elsewhere, so we could eliminate all that. Uh, you're looking for leaks. Camera does that 24-7. So do I need to have somebody out there for two hours a shift, so 12-hour shift, that means four hours a day somebody's out there looking for it. Or I can have a camera with sensors on it. We have some plants that have uh, automated drones that, uh, that, that fly, fly a routine schedule uh, with a whole variety of sensors on them that's doing it constantly. So I don't, I don't need that person doing it anymore. So it's just an example of there's a variety of things that you can do that eliminates part of their role that then gives them the time now to do something else. So that whole idea of uh, technology can afford you to do something else. Um, you know, it, it, um, 
uh, again, you, you've got to go into the details of doing those uh, value creation events, but your alternative is to just always say, you know, well, we'll get around to it, and you know, and you you never get around to it, or you just do a little bit. So people say, well, I don't know if we've got the time to do these value creation events. That could take six months. And I said, yeah, in six months in a day, you'll have this value. If you do nothing, you'll be right where you are today in six months. So uh, it's worth that somewhat of that investment. Thank you. Yeah, the only, th the only thing I would add on to that uh, is that the six month time frame. a lot of the research says that your short term performance actually decreases when you start doing uh, digital transformation work. And it is about six months before you sort of then uh, come out of it. And just being aware of that short term performance mm -hmm. dip uh, and not letting it uh, intimidate you. And, and as a manager, sort of recognizing this and it, people are learning a new way of doing things. And it is going to mean uh, for the short term, we don't do as well, but we're trading that for long term gains. And that's what just managers and supervisors need to be aware of that. And, and Jerry, you were absolutely right. We were lucky that uh, COVID occurred when it did. Obviously, it would have been wonderful if COVID never occurred. But we had a lot of stuff. We had a lot of energy momentum going in 2019 and then COVID hit. And now our, our plants never stopped operating. I mean, you know, uh, I, I worked from home for two weeks and then we were back in the office because, you know, all of the operations folks are at the plant. So we should be at least in the office as well type thing. We weren't traveling, but we were still there. But, uh, but we did have a lot of folks that had forced time on their hands. You know, a lot of our technical groups were not able to do what, you know, they would normally do. And we were able to dedicate them to, to really, you know, uh, amp up some of our value creation events. So you're, you're right, that timing actually, we were ready. Uh, we called them shovel ready projects. We had some things that were ready to go and we were able to divert some resources to that and then come out uh, a little bit faster on the other end. Hung? Hi, um, I'm Anrella from Avery Dennison. Just a question as you went through this process and you, you just mentioned you had some uniqueness in the sense of COVID mm -hmm. allowed for some time. How would, how would your transformation team change? Because again, initially up front, uh, you don't have the green curve. So you have Correct. to find a way to create space. Did you um, add more people initially to the teams to help actually get things started before you could move some space mm -hmm. um, to create some time? Or how, what, what was that kind of process? Uh, 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 great, great question. And I'm sure every one of these is unique. So I'll, I'll give you what we did, and that's not saying that's gonna work for everybody. We actually started out a little small. I had like five people. Now in transformation, I probably got 25 people. Uh, but uh, some of this, you know, we, we talked earlier today around, you know, voice of the customer and you want to go out and hear what people's, you know, needs are. But it's a little bit like the, the Henry Ford, you know, my customer only asks for a faster horse. I mean, if you're really transforming, your customer really doesn't know what they want. You know, if we wanted to the plant and said, you know, what do you guys need to transform your world? They didn't have a good example of that. So a number of the things that we did, um, we kind of took a bet on saying that, you know, we, we really believe this is going to be helpful. AR, VR was like that. I mean, you, you knew that there were going to be examples of training that would be helpful. But we have turned out to use, we, we now have all of our plants, all 13 of our global sites scanned digitally. Um, and, um, and so, I mean, that's, that's more AR than VR, but we have some VR as well. But we're f constantly finding now new applications for that that um, we didn't know originally. So really how we've grown is we did enough of these pilots and identified enough things to push that we've identified you know, a lot of uh, additional use cases than we had in mind in the beginning. I, my, my line is, is we, have been, we have been yet to be surprised on the downside. Things that we've said, yet we wanna go after that, we've found much more upside than downside. Any other mm -hmm. questions? Yeah, we have a question from one of our online members. The red and green chart you showed earlier is reminiscent of the shift desired in Six Sigma. Was Six Sigma part of the project? And if so, did it drive the digital solution or was the shift purely from the digital solution implementation? Uh, okay, good question. So I'm a, I'm a, a former master black belt uh, and, and champion back, back in the days when we were, we were very actively doing that. Uh, the, these value creation events I mentioned, I mentioned was a collection of agile tools. Almost all of those tools came from you know, former Six Sigma trainings that, that we had done. So, so yes, I would say Six Sigma played a role uh, in a sense of some work process tools. Um, 
I, I wouldn't say, though, that it, it had a huge piece in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, um, the, uh, the application or the, the affordances that we got from red curve, green curve, because a lot of that was, was less data quality driven and more just kind of work process changes. But, uh, but those uh, agile tools, some of the Six Sigma tools to mapping the process, uh, um, um, you know, were, were quite helpful in being able to eliminate waste. Yeah, I would add in that, you know, if you're a Six Sigma place that you have to unlearn some of the Six Sigma stuff, um, because when you're experimenting, you can't be at that level of perfection. And when you're trying new things, it's just not reasonable. And even GE um, matched, paired Six Sigma with their a FastWorks program, which was actually developed by this guy, Eric Reese, that I had talked about um, to, to complement Six Sigma, because you have to break some of that to be experimental and transformative. Mm -hmm. And one other thing, uh, you know, um, and again, I say this as a, as a former black belt and master black belt, the, um, we were really pushing for everyone is involved. So you know, the, one of the difficulties that we had with uh, um, when we did Six Sigma back, back in the you know, early, early 2000s uh, was uh, the black belts did stuff, the green belts did stuff, and, and so everybody else would say, you know, so when's the black belt going to show up and do this for us? Where what we're really trying to do from a transformation standpoint is it's everybody. Uh, you know, your job has to change. You're not waiting for somebody else to do it. You've got to change. Uh, and, you know, you have to make that choice. If you, it, uh, as I always say, your green curve is tailored to you and your innate abilities. But if you don't have a green curve, if you say, you know, ah, no, I think I know everything I need to know and, you know, I'm not going to learn anything new, well, then we don't have a job for you. Uh, and, and we're very deliberate about that. We, we absolutely <laughs> tell people we don't have a job for you. Uh, but you made that choice. You know, you said, you know, there's nothing I can learn. Uh, you know, we're a learning environment. So if, if you choose not to learn, then, then the plant down the street, you know, might have a role for you. Question? Yeah, so, um, so it's Catherine Broman from Queen's University in Canada, actually. Jerry, I was a former UGA. Hi, yeah, nice to see you. <laughs> how are you? Um, good, how are you? The, um, the question I have is actually one for Jerry Kane and then one for you, Jerry. The, um, but the first one, Jerry's story is a significant operational backbone story where there, the investment made specifically i think your line your industry would require you to put that backbone down before mm -hmm. you could in, get into any transformational gains and i wonder if jerry kane has an example of a company that got gains without such a major investment at the beginning boy you're you're Put me on the spot. Um, do you have a question for Jerry while I think about that example? Yeah, yeah. So it, because well, I think I'll, I'll take a shot at that. Yeah. I mean, some of the work that we've done around the, the red curve and eliminating stuff, you don't have to invest in a lot of that. A lot of that is just really capitalizing what you have in place. A lot of the other stuff, absolutely. I mean, you, you got to work on your data pipeline. You got to have you know some some modern platforms. So yes, there absolutely is. The digital transformation does require, at least in manufacturing, some, some digital investment. Well, and maybe I'll ask you the question and then I'll let Jerry think about that other one. Because yep. how much of your operational backbone, like percentage of capacity, are you currently using, would you say? Like for all, everything you've put in place, are you using it at 15% or 40%? So, so or? when you say the... To, you know, the, the plants are obviously trying to run at you know 110% of their capacity. But yeah, uh, I'm talking uh, more like the resource, the digital resources that you built. So the data that you captured, all the different resources that you put down as part of that backbone. Are you operating at using? So, so that last work stream, that asset performance management work stream. Uh, to your point, you got to make a fair amount of investment. I mean, we have thousands of sensors in the field now. Um, you. You don't capitalize on all those until you get a lot of the models built. So yeah. one of the big things we do there is, is anomaly detection. So you have all this information coming in, and you're trying to detect if something has changed uh, long before it ever goes into an alarm. And so you have to build thousands of models to, to do that. We're in that process. And I get that question a lot when I'll get that from my, my business team where they'll say, well, there was an unplanned event last night. How come you guys didn't see that ahead of time? It's like, because we haven't built all those models. We haven't seen that before. Yeah. Uh, so that would be a case where we haven't taken full advantage yet of, every, of everything that we think we've put in place. Which, which I think would be challenging in managing your senior leadership team because, to your point, they expect you to have all these answers because of the investment that they've made. 
Yeah, and oh, so, absolutely. Yeah. I get reminded of that every, <laughs> every, every quarter when I give a roll up of how we're doing. Because actually, when I say that we, we've generated at a $350 million target, we're about 165. I probably gave the wrong number earlier. We're about 165 into that. But um, I'll sometimes get challenged saying, well, gee, I don't see all that value in my bottom line. And, and um, that's because you, you, you have to plug all the holes in the bucket until you get full value, particularly that asset performance management. Yeah. You know, so we've eliminated several different things that would have taken the plant down. You plug that up, but then something else takes the plant down. So to my commercial team, they'll say, well, well, gee, you know, you lost you know, money we lost because the plant went down. You know, I thought you guys eliminated that. Uh, and, you know, you don't, you don't get the full value until you've truly modeled everything and you eliminate all that. Um, so you get, you get some of the challenge there. Yeah. But, you know, you try to tell, you know, you, you, you tell the story, make the case, show the value. And clearly we have, you know, we have moved the needle some as well. But... You're, 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 I agree with your point. Uh, um, you you got to fully over you. You got to really kind of hit a tipping point to really say there's no doubt we're seeing the value here. And that, that takes time. A lot of your big hardline numbers, which for us in manufacturing would be, uh, you know, plant fixed cost of, you know, variable costs with yields and then unplanned events. Those are lagging indicators. Uh, you don't really claim value on that for, you know, at least three years type thing. Uh, you know, we're in year four, so yeah. uh, uh, at least that's my story and I'm sticking to it that uh, <laughs> we're on the right path. You just got to finish that journey or continue that journey. Yeah. Jerry, do you have a, uh, an example? Yeah, well, now I have too, too many examples. Okay. Um, <laughs> now, once you gave me time, too long. Um, first, I think, it, you know, I do think it would be difficult in manufacturing um, where, you know, you do have a much more capital intensive environment. Um, in other industries, what I've seen is a model that's worked pretty well. And I'll refer to Goldman Sachs because I've seen them do it, but other com plenty of other companies do this is sort of an internal uh, incubator, startup incubator and accelerator. Um, so employees can pr pitch ideas to senior leadership once per year about projects that should get implemented. And they pick a handful, you know, two, one, two. Um, and those employees get the funds, the time to, to drive that innovation. And so it really doesn't cost the, the company much at all. And the thing I like about that approach um, is it does begin to call more importantly than the individual initiatives, it starts to cultivate that entrepreneurial mindset where it's employees start to look for problems that can be fixed. It's not about implementing tools. It's, and that's what, you know, I teach entrepreneurship. So it's, it's what's the problem? Where's the pain point in the market um, that we're going to try to fix with this technological solution? And you can do that internally as well. And then there are other examples. CarMax has a lot of experimentation teams. Honeywell in there, uh, I guess it's probably the closest to, um, you know, manufacturing. It started with a two-man team focusing on digital transformation, and now they're up to 75 to 100 mm -hmm. um, in, in what they're working on. So it's just about finding ways to sort of experiment and scale. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Great. I appreciate your time today. <laughs> I think we're finished, Jerry. Okay. You did great. Thanks, Jerry. Good to see you again. Bye-bye.